Hi and welcome to the channel. This time around I'm doing Invisible Man movies. I've got three of them. They were sent to me by Umbrella Entertainment. I'm going to review them. They are from the 1940s and each one seems to be in something of a different genre from the other two which makes it kind of interesting that they've been boxed together in one trilogy. But first I should get rid of the sunglasses and put on my proper glasses. Much better. Um, how are you? Everything's going fine here. So the movies themselves are these three in the Retro Horror Triple Feature. The Invisible Man Returns from 1940, The Invisible Woman from 1940, and Invisible Agent from 1942. And as I said, they're each in their own little genre. The first one is kind of like a crime investigation thing. The second one is a screwball comedy. And the third one is a World War II propaganda piece against the Nazis. All within the umbrella of being sequels to the original 1935 version of The Invisible Man, the one with Claude Rains in it. Based, of course, on the H.G. Wells novel. Now, unlike myself with my little green screen antic at the start of the video, they did the invisibility thing somewhat differently in 1940. The special effects were supervised by John P. Fulton, and he did a pretty good job of it. There's a couple of moments of how did they do that in these three movies, which is kind of fun to watch. The way they did it was the actors were clad in black velvet and shot against a black velvet backdrop. So you got the clothes moving around, and that was then superimposed on the plate of the other actors and the things they were interacting with. There's a lot of things on uh, fishing line, wandering around to make it look like they're being held by an invisible person. And on the Blu-ray, you can kind of detect it in some cases, but not all. So this was cutting edge special effects for 1940 and 1942, made by Universal who had in the 1930s really made their mark on horror movies with Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, and all the rest. And this is a continuation of that. These are definitely just programmers. They're not A pictures, but they are part of the history of science fiction and science fiction special effects in cinema. And all three of them are kind of entertaining. Let's start with The Invisible Man Returns. And this one was made in 1940. It stars Vincent Price as Sir Jeffrey Radcliffe. A man who is in prison and about to be executed for the murder of his brother Michael, a crime he said he didn't commit. Fortunately, one of Jeffrey's friends is the brother of the Claude Rains character in the original Invisible Man, and he concocts another invisibility potion which he manages to get into prison and inject into Jeffrey, and Jeffrey vanishes. And he sets out to investigate the murder of his brother, Michael, and find out who really did it. The Radcliffe family owns some coal mines, and there's a little bit to do with coal mine because the brother was killed in a mine shaft at one of the coal mines. Now, the supervisor of the coal mines is a very shifty character whose name is um, Willie Spears. And he's played by Alan Napier, who people remember best for playing Alfred the Butler in the 1966 Batman TV series. But that was at the end of a long and illustrious career of acting. Now, the main suspect, and the guy who, spoiler, does turn out to be the murderer, is a guy called Richard Cobb, played by Cedric Hardwick. He um, is running things while Jeffrey's in prison waiting to be executed. He's going to own the mine. And, of course, Jeffrey has a fiance played by Nan Gray, who is helping him out in investigating who actually did the murder, finding out what's happening and getting the thing solved. As I said in my last video when I was talking about the Fritz Lang Indian movies, this movie, The Invisible Man Returns, was directed by a German director, Joe May, who directed the 1921 version of The Indian Tomb, the movie that Fritz Lang remade in the late 1950s. Now, there was a lot of problems in the production of this film because Joe May didn't talk English. Or I should say he didn't speak English. But English um, was foreign to him. He'd obviously fled the Nazis. But his lack of English language skills made it difficult for him to direct people. Now, the other funny thing about this film is that Vincent Price only appears at the end of the film. He is acting under bandages and, and with the black velvet special effects 
suit and, and things like that. But we only actually get to see Vincent Price in the last few minutes of the movie, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Vincent Price wasn't a big star in those days. He was a leading man. He was still a good looking rooster. But he wasn't as well known as he would become in later years. One of the witnesses of crime is Willie Spears, the character played by Alan Napier. And Jeffrey goes and uh, basically terrorizes the guy into telling the truth about what actually happened. And there is a bit of nastiness involving Jeffrey um, treating him with a lot less respect than even somebody who is hiding a murder deserves. There's, there's a kind of torture aspect to it which is really awkward. In the meantime, the real bad guy, Richard Cobb, played by Cedric Hardwick, is trying to find out what happened to Jeffrey and to stop him. So it's a nice little actioner in some ways. Alan Napier's Willie Spears character, he's, he's got a Northern English accent, and his character is kind of pathetic and very much unlike the character we saw in Batman. And I like that. I, I like the fact that even if he is playing it kind of theatrically rather than cinematically. His character is memorable and we kind of care about what happens to him in a very odd kind of way. And the movie raises that question of the original Griffin in The Invisible Man was driven mad by his invisibility and something to do with the chemical concoction that made him invisible. But this movie leans to the conclusion that Jeffrey's bouts of mania that occur while he's invisible during the film are possibly more to do with the circumstances of invisibility and not being able to be seen in it and the alienation that is caused by being an invisible person. Both the original Invisible Man and this one can be looked at as kind of analogies for drug addiction and the negative effects of drug addiction as well. Um, not just about invisibility and, and how cool it will be to be invisible and how it will make you a megalomaniac. And this movie takes a slightly kinder view of that than the first one does. And it's quite good. There's a couple of action scenes, one of which it takes place on uh, some trolleys at a colliery. And there's also some experimentation on guinea pigs in the lab that go on while the invisibility experiments are being carried out. And there's a kind of oddness about invisible guinea pigs with little harnesses on being injected with various solutions by a scientist. It's, um, it makes it fun, in a sense, and the whole movie itself is kind of fun. It concludes in, in the usual universal hero of heroin, do okay at the end of the movie kind of way, and that's fine too. The special effects are really good, particularly when... Jeffrey is re-emerging from his invisibility. John P. Fulton, Bernard B. Brown and William Hedgecock received an Oscar in the category of Best Special Effects. And rightly so, working with the limitations of 1940 and 1940 filmmaking, they did a really good job of evoking invisibility. And that's something all three of these movies have in common. They really work hard to sell the premise and that makes them extra interesting. The second movie, The Invisible Woman, is a screwball comedy. I'll read you the blow from the back. Eccentric Professor Gibbs, played by John Barrymore. Yes, the John Barrymore. Brilliant but impractical, invents an invisibility machine and advertises for a guinea pig. What he gets is Kitty Carroll, played by Virginia Bruce, an attractive, adventurous model who thinks being invisible will help her settle a few scores. Complications arise when three comic gangsters steal the machine to use on their boss, but they fail to reckon with the revenge of the invisible woman. Now, this was right at the end of the career of John Barrymore. He was suffering from alcoholism. He died not too long after the movie came out. And because of the memory loss from his alcoholism, most of his dialogue was written on cue cards held up around the set while he was doing his job. 
and um, that doesn't really show. He's very smooth playing the professor, and Professor Gibbs is a nice comic character. Put yourself in the garage, lazy bones. He's over the top, he's silly, he's grumpy, but he's a lot of fun. Professor Gibbs is being funded by a guy called Richard Russell, played by John Howard. Now, John Howard's a name that Australians know very well. There's actually an actor here in Australia called John Howard. And we have one of our worst prime ministers, the one we had from 1996 to 2007, was called John Howard. So we'll leave that aside, but... There is a cognitive dissonance for Australians when you say John Howard. So John Howard's character, Richard Russell, uh, is financing the experiments of Professor Gibbs. When Kitty Carroll comes along, because he, he was expecting to get a guy for the experiment, he puts an ad in the paper saying, person wanted who wants to become invisible, contact me, no remuneration. And he gets a woman, she enjoys the invisibility in fact she uses it she's a model in a department store modeling the clothing for women and her boss mr growley played by character actor charles lane is a total menace he's a nightmare to work with he treats the women who work for him badly he's capricious and nasty and he gets his come up and actually becomes a better person when an invisible woman Guess her revenge on him in a very funny way. So I like that part of the film. It's a lot of fun. All right, Carol, don't try to sneak by. You were two minutes late this morning. You're docked an hour's pay. That's unfair. I've never been late before. And besides, two minutes is exactly one thirtieth of an hour. Well, really, Carol. Maybe you'd like to take up bookkeeping somewhere else. Then you get three gangsters. One called Foghorn. One called Bill and one called Hammerhead. Now Hammerhead is played by none other than Shemp Howard when he was taking a little hiatus from the Three Stooges. And dig this, Professor Gibbs' assistant, Mrs. Jackson, is played by Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Well, I don't know as I want to see folks get invisible. Might give me a turn. It's her or you, Mrs. Jackson. Take your choice. You are either victim or chaperone. All right, all right, I'll tell her. And Margaret Hamilton has great fun and great chemistry playing off John Barrymore in this movie. There's a lot of fun to be had with this one. The dialogue's snappy and funny, and it lifts the movie really well. We also get Charles Ruggles playing George, um, Dick Russell's assistant and butler. And he has a lot of the good comedy stuff too. Between Margaret Hamilton and Shemp Howard, and Charles Ruggles, and John Barrymore. There's a lot of very seasoned comedic actors in this movie. The other person you get in here is somebody that I watched in another movie recently, and who turned up in one of the Harry Palmer films. Actually, two, was it two? Yes, two of the Harry Palmer films that Michael Caine did in the 1960s. And that is Oscar Homolka playing Blackie, the boss who wants to get back to America. He's hiding out in Mexico. He figures if he gets an invisibility, he'll be able to go home and visit the family and visit the town, visit New York and visit all the things he likes. They steal the invisibility machine, but they don't know that you also need an injection to make it work. So this one plays really nicely as a screwball comedy. I think it's an underestimated screwball comedy of the 1940s as well. It's light, it's fun, it's frothy, it's got very, very fine actors in them. And the story for the movie, oddly enough, was written by Kurt C. Odmack, who had a long history with science fiction cinema, and Joe May. Now, I'm not sure how Joe May wrote it, given the fact his English was very limited. But Kurt C. Odmack wrote the story upon which the movie was based with Joe May. Now, if you don't know who Kurt C. Odmack was, he did a lot of 1950s science fiction movies like Bride of the Gorilla, The Magnetic Monster, Riders of the Stars, Creature with the Atomic Brain, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, and The Beast with Five Fingers. So the screenwriter was good. The comedy was just such fun in this film. And I wasn't expecting a comedy to be in this box set. 
but there was, and I was very grateful for it. That brings us to 1942 and the Invisible Agent. In 1942 America was a very different place than 1940 America. So Invisible Agent, we've got John Hall playing a guy who runs a printing shop, who is the descendant of the original Invisible Man and who has the formula for invisibility. So a bunch of thugs led by a Nazi, played by Cedric Hardwick, and a Japanese agent, played by Peter Lorre, come and visit him to get the formula. Come, come, Mr. Griffin, while there is still time. This won't help you much. No? The choice is yours. He escapes by the skin of his teeth after Peter Lorre threatens to get his fingers off and decides that he's not going to do anything with the formula and really doesn't want to put it out there because of the dangers involved with invisibility. Then Pearl Harbor happened, and the character, whose surname is Griffin, goes to the American government and says, and says, I will let the invisibility formula be used, but only if I use it. I'm the only one that's going to use it. I'm the only one that needs to know what this formula is. And so they send him on a mission into Germany to find out about a big plan to do a kind of 1940s 9-11 on America with bombers, with sabotage and all that kind of thing. He's got to get the information out. He's got to find out who's doing it. He's got to find out when they're doing it. It's one of those patriotic World War II propaganda movies. And that's okay too because you've got good actors in this. He meets a German woman who is playing both sides against the middle ostensibly played by Elena Massey, who was actually Hungarian, as indeed was Peter Lorre. And she has a liaison with not only the bad guy played by Cedric Hardwick, but with another Nazi played by a portly character actor called J. Edward Bromberg. And there's some great moments in this film. There's a bit where Frank, who's the protagonist, basically has to strip off his clothing while parachuting into Germany. You get some good moments from Peter Lorre as Baron Ikito who is a lot smarter than the Nazis. There's a lot of really good dialogue in this one, just saying how Nazis are a bunch of dogs who will eventually eat each other up. And we see a bit of that in the movie when, with interactions between the Nazis. There are some interrogation scenes which are kind of icky. And it is very much a World War II propaganda piece. But having said that, there's some very clever stuff in here. The way Baron Akito traps an invisible man is really horrible and really interesting as well. And you get some very nice dialogue between John Hall's character and Alona Massey's character, who's called Maria, which kind of foreshadows some of the dialogue you get in Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. There's a little bit of that kind of dynamic going on, and that can't be by accident. Again, this was a script by Kurt Jobmack, who had left Europe because of the Nazis, so he really he didn't pull any punches. There's some really interesting actors between Heiser, played by J. Ewa Bromberg, and John Hall's character Frank, which goes full in on the hatred of the Nazis that everybody to this very day should have. And the people who are seriously dangerous to our civilization should be given no ground because they will always ask more. And a lot of this dialogue does that. It's very hard punching dialogue. You've sent thousands of innocent people to these rat holes. Now you're in one yourself. In a few hours, you'll be shot. You know how it'll happen. Exactly how. You've given the orders yourself too often. Your kind doesn't just kill men. You murder their spirits. You strangle their last breath of hope and freedom so that you, the chosen few, can rule your slaves in ease and luxury. You're a sadist just like the others, Heiser. A lot of people in this film, and a lot of people involved in this film, had fled Europe. Elena Massey fled Europe. Peter Lorre fled Europe. Kurtz Jobmack fled Europe. So, in the same way that Casablanca has that layer of lived experience and, and realism, even something as light as Invisible Agent really has a groundedness that I like. Um, I love the fact that they were fighting for civilization and made no bones about it. 
and that makes this movie probably the most interesting of the three in some ways but I'm glad I've got this one this is region B but I think um, I haven't tried it on my region free player with the settings set to other places but this box set works for me Umbrella Entertainment are a sponsor of this channel they just sent me this one to review and I like it I think that if you're into 1940s universal horror films you need to have these three in your collection they show the breadth of story that you can tell with one concept and they don't have anything that I found offensive there's no racial stereotypes particularly in this film apart from the fact that the Germans who were Nazis were not always the most intelligent of people. The action moves along really well in all three of them. So the first one you got a murder mystery, the second one you got a screwball comedy that lands really nicely. And Virginia Bruce has a nice touch with the comedy in that one as well. And in the third one you've got some of my favourite actors of the time. Cedric Hardwick not particularly, but Peter Laurie particularly. And I kind of like Alona Massey in this as well. I think she's got a, a difficult role to play and she does it quite well. And J. Edward Bromberg, who did a lot of work on stage in America, is really good as Heiser. He gives us that's the slimiest of Nazis in the best possible way. So anyway, that's it for this time around. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hit like, hit subscribe, and leave a comment. Tell me what you think of them and what other universal horror films I should cover from that particular time period. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash paleocinema. Got more stuff coming up next week. There's some interesting things I just got in from Indicator in the UK, which I want to review. And I've got more stuff coming from Umbrella, so I'm not going to miss out on anything, particularly science fiction and weird movies in general. So it's going to be a good couple of months for this channel. So also tell your friends about the channel. If you've got friends who are movie buffs, sling them a link. It helps us with the channel and it helps you getting good with your friends too. So until next time, look after yourselves. Watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some movies that aren't necessarily the ones you think of when you think Invisible Man. And I'll catch you next time.